I met Ron Kurtz in 1990, and we started teaching together almost immediately. And I spent 20 years, the last 20 years of his life, teaching with him and representing him in trainings all over the world. I learned so much, not just about Hakomi, but about teaching from Ron. And I feel really important material about uh, how to teach and how to uh, invite people to learn Hakomi in a Hakomi way as, is something that we want to share with you. Uh, Georgia and I both now teach internationally and have had the opportunity to teach in so many different settings with different cultures. But the one thing that we have in common, I think, is this uh, real importance we place on making sure that people are learning the method in an experiential way. I met you and Ron together. Mm -hmm. And I had just fallen in love with a very dear man who had, was a student of Ron and Donna's. And he took me to a couples workshop. And so in that workshop, I, um, I met Hakomi. Uh, it was a delicious workshop because I was newly in love. And so you can imagine uh, being with a, a new sweet partner in doing these loving presence exercises and these mindfulness exercises and the simple exercise of asking someone to call you by your name exactly how you want it. And, and so there was a really a beautiful richness to my early experience with the method. And, um, and it was an experience. There was no lecture. Uh, we were, it was quite a large group of couples that were there. Um, and it was just one small exercise after another that built into a, a feeling. And uh, it was a very um, loving feeling, a very soft and gentle feeling. And I had come out of the bioenergetic uh, practices of using your voice and using your power and expressing your anger. And, um, and so one of the questions I had was like, where are the fireworks? There don't seem to be a lot of fireworks. And yet I appreciated the subtlety of what I was experiencing that first time. You know, the, you talk about the subtlety, and I think it's really important, Georgia, uh, both the gentleness of the method and the subtlety of it sometimes belie the power of it. But there's a wonderful law in physics that was explained to me as, uh, it's called the Weber-Fechsner law, everybody knows that one, I guess, but it was explained to me this way, is that if you're carrying a piano and a fly lands on the piano, you won't notice the weight of the fly. But if you're carrying a feather and the fly lands on it, then you notice the weight of the fly. And in Hakomi, we have this understanding that if we quiet things down and slow things down and then have an experience in that kind of quiet, slow, mindful state, it will be very obvious what the experience is and it'll be very powerful. And it's the experience, as we know, that, that changes us, that changes the brain. So. I'm so glad that you and I both are so committed to providing the learning in an experiential way. And I encountered the power of Hakomi when I took my sweet man down for supervision, which is a process of being certified in the method. He had finished his training and he was ready to practice the method. And I volunteered as a client and I had the privilege of seeing people uh, working and I had my first uh, experience with uh, Ron coaching a session that someone was doing with me. And Ron was famous for being intolerant of anyone who was not doing the method how he wanted it done. And so to my, for my benefit, he knocked the person out of their seat metaphorically and he did the session. And that session was about death and dying. That was in 2002, perhaps. And I, I, my um, 
new partner was sick with cancer and so I had met the love of my life and thought that I was going to lose him and that was the, the subject material that we were working with and Ron uh, gave me a verbal experiment what we call a probe and he said you don't have to worry about that right now and that hit me profoundly. That was powerful. And it lasted until Jeffrey died um, 12 years later. I was, no, I was unworried about it. I was unconcerned about it. And the experience of having him say that, it wasn't just the words. You don't have to worry about that right now. It was the wisdom behind the words. I felt like I was in the company of a circle of rabbis. I felt like I was in the company of the wisdom teachers, and I got it. And it, it sustained me, um, and it still sustains me, and it sustains my teaching, because many times I take people through that experience of wanting to die or having experience of being close to death or being in grief, and I can say with confidence that we don't have to worry about it. My experience with teaching before I came to Hakomi was teaching language and teaching yoga. So it seemed obvious to me to teach in an experiential way. And what I love about the way that we practice Hakomi and teach Hakomi, when we practice Hakomi with a client, we're trusting their own wisdom and resources. We're calling forth from them what they know on a deep level, what's outside of consciousness and needs to come into consciousness. And so it's not advice giving, we're not counseling, we're not telling them anything or trying to make anything happen or even predicting where it's going to go so much as we are creating the context for the client to learn from their experience something about themselves and something about how they organize their reactions to life and something about other possibilities of how to do that. They learn that from their experience. And it seems so obvious that since that works in a Hakomi session, that that's how we invite students in a training to learn the method. My experience with teaching uh, was with learning disabled students. And one of the things that you learn working with those students is how to parse a subject in order to allow them uh, the best conditions for learning. And you parse it as much as you need to in order for the learning to take place. And one of the things that I really love about Hakomi is it's naturally parsed. It's, we break the method down into these little experiences, these, ex, these exercises, which allow people to take a part of the method and have an experience of it. Mm -hmm. And you cannot predict what they're going to learn from it. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can trust them. You can trust that when you offer an exercise to a group of people, that somebody's going to get something. And you can't control that. I think that's one of the things that's really important as a teacher or a trainer is to not try and control the learning of the, of the students. And of course we have the benefit of Ron's genius. Ron Kurtz had the ability to come up with a practice or an exercise that would predictably give people a learning experience. And he's developed a whole way of um, inviting people into those bits, those parts of the method, in a really logical, I think, uh, sequence, even though everything is woven together ultimately, it's not so sequential. But we have part of the, our legacy that we've been given is this wonderful material that includes not just hundreds, maybe thousands of exercises and practices, that w we give to the students, that we have them working in pairs or small groups, we have, have them come back to the large group and hear what they learned from it, 
And then we can point at the theory or we can point at the name of the skills. And we do that um, based on what they come back with from the experiences they've had. So I'm really appreciative of uh, not just the exercises he's left us, but the way of coming up with the kind of exercises that are going to create learning experiences. For those of you who studied with Ron Kurtz, you'll remember that he used to say to the group, he'd, he'd be sitting there and he'd have his notepad and his, he'd be tapping his pen and he'd say, ask me a question. Mm -hmm. He was willing to start anywhere. Mm -hmm. He was willing to just respond to what was out there and it would lead us into mm -hmm. An it, experience. It's like when a client comes in the door in a Hakomi, for a Hakomi yeah. session. We don't predict what we're going to start with. We, the client shows up and we start with where they're at. And so we do that in our trainings as well. And it's, it takes a lot of experience as a teacher to work that way. We can yes. talk more about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was teaching recently in Spain and it was quite a large international group and many of the, I would say over half of the people were extremely well trained therapists. Some were psychoanalysts and some were body centered psychotherapists and they came from a, a broad range of therapies but they were really well trained therapists. And so when I opened the uh, training I asked them to do something for me. I said, could you please tuck all your skills, I know you're well trained, please tuck all your skills and techniques in a suitcase and put them at the front door. <laughs> and, and I promise you that they'll be there. You will not lose your skills. They'll be there when you leave, but just set them aside for now so that I can give you an experience of Hakomi. And to their credit, they did. Ron came up with, as you know, this wonderful exercise that's called I Don't Know, or he liked to call it groundlessness. And it's a, it's a practice, really. It's a practice of inviting people into that kind of Zen mind, beginner's mind. Sometimes when I'm starting with a brand new group, uh, I ask people to raise their hand if they think they're a total beginner and have you know nothing no experience background and the, there's always a few people that raise their hands even if they're experienced and they feel like a beginner they raise their hand and I say now would you please be willing to assist the rest of us who have preconceived ideas and think we know would you please assist us into getting into Zen mind beginners mind and everybody gets a chuckle but it's not that funny because there's something about, as you say, uh, being able to uh, let go of what we think we know. And we're asking clients to do that when they come to a session. We're asking them to, be will they're asking us for help to be willing to let go of the virtual reality they know or the sense of who they are that they've concretized but are, but it's not working for them or some way of making meaning of life, they're asking for assistance to let go of that so they can open up to new possibilities. And so we ask the students to do that and we train ourselves as Hakomi practitioners in this uh, not knowing state of mind so that we can have spacious mind, curious mind and stay open to being surprised, stay open to the mystery of what shows up. Exciting for a teacher and a trainer to also step into a training with that state of mind. So Georgia, as a trainer, when you enter the training, um, how do you actually create this kind of openness and spacious mind and willingness to see how things unfold? How do you prepare yourself to go into the training and still keep that kind of open mind? Mm -hmm. 
Well, one thing that I notice about myself is that when I'm in front of a training group, I'm very relaxed. And so I think it's that kind of uh, relaxation as a teacher. I'm not performing. I'm not being uh, anything other than who I am in the moment. Sometimes, uh, as you know, as some of uh, as my students know, I've been going through a grieving process, and I bring it. I bring it to my students. I make sure that I'm uh, I'm transparent and I'm available to. Uh, my own process as well as to others' processes so that um, I, there's not a differential, a power mm -hmm. differential between us. So that's one thing is that mm -hmm. kind of confidence mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and calmness. And then the other thing I think that I do automatically is I register how many people are there. So if I have a very small group, sometimes I'm teaching at home and I have a group of four or five or six people and I adjust everything to that. There's an invitation mm -hmm. towards intimacy that can occur in a very small group, for example, than a group uh, in Spain that I might walk into and it has 40 people. And I'll make adjustments mm -hmm. uh, to size. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think what you do is something like what I do, which is that your attention goes right away to the students, to the group. I remember years and years and years, years ago, being <laughs> asked to, to speak to a group uh, of people that, uh, I was a yoga teacher and these were people training for a marathon. And so they, they weren't interested in yoga, actually. This was years and years ago. And I hadn't done that kind of talk before. I'd taught school kids, but not adults. And I remember feeling nervous when I first stepped in the room and then Somebody asked a question and I got fascinated with them. And then I got fascinated with who else was in there. And I know that I used that as a little bit of a trick in the early years of my teaching. And, you know, take the attention off of worrying about myself and what I was going to do. And just the same as you do if a client steps into your office to do a Hakomi session, you get fascinated with who's there, who, who's, who's here and who shows up. And we're responding to that. We're responding to it whether we're in a one-to-one -one Hakomi situation, whether there's four people in the room or whether there's 40 people in the room. There was one workshop that Ron and I did. I'm not sure if it's that one you went to, the, the Loving Presence one. And 130 people showed up. And we were used to working with 30 people. And, and it was the same. It was, you know, you feel, you feel the, the people in the room, you feel the group, you give them the same practices, they do them in their small groups, they come back and whoever speaks reports. And so right away, I, I really get that feeling of relaxing and, and feeling confident and remembering, reminding ourselves that st education is calling forth. And I think, uh, it's not just that we're calling forth from students what they know. They're calling forth from us what they need. I think, Georgia, sometimes people realize that we're responding to them, to what shows up, to the day, to the the experiences that our people are having in the exercises that we're doing or practices. And they may not realize how much preparation we are actually doing. We're not coming in with a, a lesson plan that we follow, okay, now we're gonna do that practice and that exercise. But I know both you and I have uh, years of, of planning that creates a context for us to support learning moment to moment, as it's needed, but in this larger context. Talk a little bit about your planning. So part of my planning is that I'm working with Ron's materials all the time. I'm um, currently working on a project of redesigning the handbook that he left in 2011 when he died. And it was an unfinished symphony. And it's, can you imagine going in after you know, after the fact with, uh, you know, someone who I regard as a master therapist and really quite a genius 
and trying to work with his materials. And so it's like a, a big project and it's mm. a, a demanding project. How do you how do you sort it and organize it and how do you take his point form notes and expand it into really uh, readable and learnable material. So I'm working with his materials all the time. I'm working with his video materials. I'm uh, working with uh, Terry on the archival project. Last June I went down to uh, spend time with Terry on this arc to really begin this archival project and I spent I don't know three or four days in his office and on his computer and on his hard drives and uh, uncovering all the files in his file in his garage and going through like tons and tons of material and by doing that pieces of the method become more robust for me and they become uh, richer and I see uh, original documents and then I see the mm -hmm. iterations of his thinking and I see the progression of his thinking and that informs me as a teacher. I feel like I can uh, talk about the method with some degree of authority and some degree of competency but only because I have read and read and read and reread mm -hmm. and thought about the uh, thought about the materials. And I'll add one little note to that because, of course, I've got that similar background and not just reading Ron's materials, but writing a lot of it with him and continuing to rewrite what we've started. But um, I think an important part of our planning as trainers that I would really encourage anyone wanting to teach or train is the frontline work that we do, is that we continue to work with clients and we continue to practice Hakomi in that kind of way as well as to teach it. So without, I think without that experience of practicing Hakomi, uh, our teaching would, would be weaker. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure this is true for you, Donna, but I'm working with people from all over the world. I'm working through a video conference medium mm -hmm. that allows me to be uh, present for uh, some of our teachers and trainers, some of our people who want to be um, want to be certified in the method, and uh, we're joining in that virtual reality to really uh, keep people connected to the method in a in a very active way, mm -hmm. and as you say, that keeps us really in touch with the method as a living yes. uh, body of work. Right. Mm -hmm.